All right. And I am so excited to see all of you here. Uh, you know, when you put these sessions together, you're not sure how many folks are going to come. And just, so to see a packed room to hear about uh, the things that Anthology is doing with Control Tower is really, really exciting. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is. This is COP203, Building and Governing Multi-Accounts Using AWS Control Tower. Before we get started, I just want to do a quick show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you work for an organization that manages more than one AWS account. All right, yep, lots of people here. Wait, now keep them up if you manage more than 10 AWS accounts. More than 50? More than 100? More than 200? How many do you have? 500, awesome. Wow. Okay, so you can put your hands down. Uh, if you raise your hand, you are definitely in the right session. Uh, we are gonna talk about the ways for managing multiple accounts. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, and maybe you only have one or no AWS accounts, but you're curious about how this might work for managing multiple accounts, you're also in the right session. So you've all done really well today showing up here. My name is Galen Dunkelberger. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. Uh, as a solutions architect, it's my job to work with strategic ed techs to help them find ways to leverage AWS services to meet their business objectives. And joining me today is my friend and colleague from Anthology, Tim Geston. I'll let Tim introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Geston. I'm a senior staff engineer at Anthology, and I primarily work with our AWS infrastructure, architecting and engineering solutions. Cool, thanks, Tim. So what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna go over some of the challenges that Anthology had around account provisioning and governance, especially when COVID hit. And then Tim's gonna talk about the solution that he and his team developed using a mixture of AWS services such as Control Tower, third-party software, and custom-built software, and wrapping it all in a GitOps approach to, to uh, account provisioning and governance. Tim will talk about the outcomes of that solution and also some of the lessons that they learned that you might want to consider when implementing a similar solution at your organization. And if we have time, we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. Sound good? All right. Tim, do you want to start off by telling everyone who Anthology is and what they do? Yeah, sure. Anthology is a leading ed tech provider with over 150 million users and over 60 SaaS products. Back in October of 2021, Blackboard and Anthology merged to create the largest ed tech ecosystem at a global scale. And to serve their customers, Anthology runs over 93 workloads on AWS. And those workloads use a variety of services across a broad spectrum of, of categories, including things like compute, storage, databases, security, analytics, and AIML. And to serve their global customers, Anthology deploys to 14 of uh, AWS has 26 uh, launched regions. So now that we know a little bit about Anthology, let's talk about some of the challenges that they had around their account provision and governance. So like many companies first starting out in the cloud, Anthology started with a small number of AWS, AWS accounts that steadily grew over time. Now this slow, steady growth of their cloud estate uh, led them to adopt processes around account provisioning and governments in sort of an organic uh, fashion. And often those processes were, were based on similar processes that they had for on-premise resources. Now, this worked fine for a long time. It was mostly manageable until around 2020 when we all know what happened. With lockdown in place and online learning becoming the new norm, COVID-19 brought about a surge of customer demand for Anthology services. Now, I don't know how many of you have school-aged children, but I have four. And so suddenly my uh, kitchen, my den, my dining room, and my office all became classrooms. And this really led to an explosion in the number of AWS accounts that Anthology had to provision and govern. But we'll come back to this problem in a minute. For some of you out there, you may be asking the question, well, why do they even need that many accounts? Can't you just do everything in one AWS account? And if there are some of you here that are running your production workloads in a single or a few shared AWS accounts and it's working for you, 
That's great. You're not doing anything wrong. But I tend to see with many customers is that after a while, they start to run into certain challenges when working in a shared AWS environment. So for instance, multiple development teams working in the same account. Maybe they're using infrastructure as code, they're deploying resources, they're tearing resources down. And what we often see is that one development team will, will have a naming clash with some resource uh, of another development team or possibly delete resources uh, of another development team. Now, there are certainly workarounds that you can put in place to prevent this. So you could do things like naming conventions, uh, you could put in IAM policies to ensure that team A can't affect the resources of team B. But all these workarounds start to become more and more burdensome and complex as, as your team, teams grow and things become larger. And so when customers ask me about this, I often suggest to them that they think about breaking out their teams into their own AWS accounts to separate and isolate them. Different business units and products have different business processes. So by using multiple AWS accounts for specific business needs, you can keep things a lot more organized and clean. So for instance, having an account that's just for centralized logging, or having an account that's just for shared network resources, or having an account for a production workload. And having multiple accounts makes it a lot easier for you to allocate costs to a specific business unit, a specific team, or even down to an individual. And finally, different workloads have different security requirements. If you're running a, a production PCI work, uh, compliant workload, that's certainly gonna have different security requirements as opposed to, say, a development environment. By having multiple AWS accounts, you can tailor the, need, the security needs to the workload that's running in those accounts. It's for these reasons and others that AWS does recommend a multi-account strategy because the AWS account is the best isolation boundary. Now, I talk to a lot of customers about their multi-account strategy, and often what I hear is, Galen, that's great, but we're, we're worried about account sprawl. Uh, we don't wanna give all of our developers their own accounts because what if they run up a big bill, or what if they open some sort of security hole that leaves us vulnerable? And at AWS, we totally understand your concerns. And that's why we've developed AWS Control Tower. Now, AWS Control Tower is the easiest way to set up and govern a multi-account AWS environment. And it does this by first setting up a landing zone. Now, a landing zone is basically a well-architected multi-account environment based on AWS best practices. Control Tower also centralizes identity and access management via AWS SSO. So with SSO, you can specify which accounts are accessed by which users with what permissions at scale. Control Tower establishes guardrails to ensure, so that you can ensure the compliance of all the accounts in your environment. And it, it sets up an account factory so that new accounts vended through Control Tower are, are vended with the established uh, guardrails that you specify, and they ship logs to a centralized logging account so that you have visibility into what's going on in those environments. And AWS Control Tower allows you to manage this over time so that as your environment grows, you can adapt to your changing needs. So went a bit on a tangent there, but I just wanted to give you all a baseline of Control Tower. Let's go back to Anthology's problem. Remember, it's 2020. You know, customer demand is through the, through the roof and they've got to create a whole bunch of AWS accounts. And the process for creating those accounts looked a little something like this. You had a development team and they needed a new AWS account. So where would they go? Well, they'd open a ticket. And what would be in that ticket? It could really be just about anything. It was pretty informal process. Who's on the other side of that ticketing system? Well, it's a lone system admin. Anybody ever been this guy? Okay, so he's doing a yeoman's job just working through this ticket backlog while also doing his day-to-day -day role. Now, the fact that this is a pretty informal process through the ticketing system means that all the parameters around what is actually needed in that account are not always clear. And so what ended up happening was you'd get into this back and forth of 
inside the ticketing system. Like, hey, what permissions do you need? Well, you know, let's, admin sounds good. Let's give us admin. Uh, are you sure you need admin? Like, let's talk about that. And well, we need it for this reason. Once all of those parameters were set, you know, then the, the system admin would have to try to find some time to, to go and create the account, set up uh, the groups in Okta, map those account, uh, map that account or those, those groups to AWS SSO permission sets, and then finally deliver the account. Now, if some of you are looking at this and think, that's my process, that's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. Let's keep in mind that this, for a long, this process for a long time worked for Anthology and it was manageable. But like I said, in 2020, this particular process was uh, causing some challenges for them. So the first challenge was that it was too manual and too informal. The, the surge in demand for AWS accounts led to, and the manual nature of this process led to a backlog that slowed everyone down. And the informal nature of using the ticketing system often led to uh, inconsistencies in the application of permissions for those accounts, which often resulted in overly permissive pr uh, privileges. And it wasn't always clear to everyone who was getting what access to where. So there was no place that a developer could go to and say, hey, what does team B over here have as far as permissions? Because we want those. And so this lack of transparency really led to some governance issues at, at Anthology. And also remember that there was a long tail of accounts that came you know, over the years. Now the access patterns for those older accounts was actually different. Uh, those older accounts would use uh, IAM Federation, while the newer accounts would use AWS SSO and Okta. And so that again created some, some governance issues around how uh, users were accessing those accounts. And finally, there was really no organizational standard as to when it was appropriate to create a new AWS account versus when we should uh, pile into maybe a shared account. So Anthology wanted to solve these problems and that's where Tim and his team come in. Thanks, Galen. Yeah, we talked to our system administrator and operations team, and we saw these same challenges. But we also saw an opportunity. We saw an opportunity to revamp our governance solution and bring more people into the fold, democratizing who can contribute. So we came up with a set of requirements. The first was standardization. We wanted to standardize a number of things. First was account granularity. What did it mean to provision a new account. When did a workload need a new account versus being put into an existing account? These are things we wanted to iron out. We also wanted to standardize on access patterns. What permissions are acceptable for a production account? We wanted this to be the same across the board. And then we also wanted to standardize on our security baseline. We wanted to move all of our manual processes to automated processes. For this solution, no manual work was gonna be acceptable. Just like we ask our product engineers to fully automate their deployment pipelines, we wanted to do the same for our infrastructure. We also wanted to move from a ticketing system to a self-service GitOps repo. And this will allow more people to contribute to the, the process and in a self-service manner, where there's not a backlog, you're not opening a ticket and asking someone else to do the work, you can actually contribute yourself. So we wanted to empower more individuals. Through automation and self-service, we we're hoping to achieve faster delivery. We didn't want any of our infrastructure processes to get in the way of our product delivery timelines. If product teams were waiting a couple weeks for an account and that set back their, their product, uh, their, uh, their deployments. That's something that was unacceptable to us. And at Anthology, security and compliance are very important to us. In fact, we have a few products that are FedRAMP moderate. We wanted to take the lessons learned from going through that approval process and apply it to the rest of our organization. We also wanted a single pane of glass view on our compliance 
of all of our accounts. And then lastly, we wanted to create a culture of least privilege access. We wanted to give engineers all the privileges they need to do their daily job, but not access permissions. We wanted to make sure that we kept our production workloads safe, and, uh, but everyone still had the ability to do their jobs. So that's why I'm excited to share with the solution that we came up with with you guys today. We created a GitOps repo with all of the resources we needed for our account governance. Those include SSO permission sets, Okta groups, Okta is our identity provider, AWS SSO account mappings, and even AWS accounts. So what would happen is development teams can clone this repo, they can then add whatever changes that they, they wish, and then make a, submit a PR back. You can see this example is a AWS account construct, and that cube there is Pulumi. Pulumi is the infrastructure as code library that we use for this solution. Has anyone in here used Pulumi before? No one, okay, good. So, uh, so Pulumi is very similar to Terraform or CloudFormation. Um, it's uh, infrastructure as code library. You can, uh, you can produce diffs and then ap apply the changes. And what we liked about Plumi was it was in TypeScript. And we could build these high-level constructs in TypeScript that are strongly typed. So a lot of our developers were already familiar with TypeScript because they use CDK. Does anyone here use CDK? Mm -hmm. Awesome, CDK is awesome. Yep. We had challenges, though, because we needed to deploy to more than just AWS. We needed to deploy to Okta as well. So that was one of the reasons we went, went with Pulumi. We also had a lot of legacy resources that we need to bring into the solution. We had existing AWS accounts, existing permission sets, existing Okta groups. And Plumi makes importing these resources very easy. And then lastly, we also needed to create dynamic providers, which is custom code that wraps uh, things like service catalog and control tower. And that's how we created our AWS account construct. But back to the solution. Once development teams submit a PR, GitHub Actions will produce a plan of the changes that this PR will make. And that allows the people reviewing the PR to understand the impact of these changes. So our cloud governance team will review the PR along with any other groups that the PR will affect. And that's when we can implement the standardization process. We can look at the AWS account and we can say, does this align with our account granularity standards? Or does this workload actually belong in one of our existing accounts? And we can have a back and forth and come to a consensus. Let's say this PR was about access and production. We can review and talk about whether this aligns with our least permission goals, or if this permission is gonna be unacceptable for a production use case. So that back and forth leads to these constructive conversations, and eventually, the PR is either approved or denied. Once the PR is approved, the GitOps pipeline starts executing. We love GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions, you can just go to the Actions tab of the GitHub repo and watch the execution of the pipeline. It even has a Pulumi plugin, which makes it very easy to, to create infrastructure as code, CI, CD frameworks. So, the GitHub Actions and Plumi will deploy Okta groups, if that was part of the PR. It'll deploy resources into our AWS management account. And those resources include SSO permission sets, SSO account mappings. And then finally, like in this example, it can create an AWS account. So let's dig a little deeper into what these constructs actually look like. I'm gonna show a little code, not too much. Here's a strongly typed AWS account construct, and this is what's in our code base. You can see that we have all the information we need to create a new AWS account. We have organizational unit, which is a group of like accounts that can have certain security guardrails applied to them. In this case, it's the development OU. 
We also have the account name, which is needed for Control Tower to provision an account. The rest are tags that we add to the account. And these tags help with our financial operations. Product can group like, like accounts to create a, a view of how much a single product is spending across all of the accounts. We have a budget owner. So if we see excessive spend in an account, we know who to contact and talk about it with. Let's see what happens once we merge this construct to main. How many people in here use Control Tower or are familiar with Control Tower? Oh, awesome. Cool. cool. For those not familiar, Control Tower doesn't have a create account API. It actually uses service catalog as the API to create new accounts. So what our construct does is it wraps service catalog. And then service catalog will create the new account. After the new account is created, a set of preventative guardrails will be put into the account by Control Tower. An example of these guardrails are a denial of public S3 buckets so we can prevent our developers from accidentally making a mistake. Another example is denying the ability to change any of the resources that Control Tower puts into the account. So let's go into which resources Control Tower puts in the account. AWS CloudTrail. Control Tower uh, puts CloudTrail and logs it to a centralized logging account also created by Control Tower in an opinionated fashion. Before adopting Control Tower, many of our products had their own centralized logging account. This made it difficult for our security tooling to bring in all of the different centralized logging accounts. With Control Tower, we've adopted their standard and we've moved to a single centralized logging account. And that's where we send all of our logs. Not just CloudTrail, but account logs, as, or, I mean, uh, application logs as well. Even our Okta logs. Control Tower also provisions an AWS config delivery stream. And those all go to a centralized audit account. And what's important about that is now we have a single pane of glass view into the compliance across our whole organization. We always say that security is everybody's problem, especially since developers now see their workloads from their machine all the way through to production. So this has helped give us the tools to allow developers to impact security. And it's helped our security team as well. Now there's only one place where they need to ingest our centralized, log, our centralized logs. But Many of you guys are probably familiar with this, but creating the account is the easy part of account governance. After the account is created, you have to figure out who has access to that account and what access do they have. So in our previous solution, we had a single team try to break down the taxonomy of all of the different products and figure out what are the right group granularities and what permissions do those groups need. That didn't end up scaling well. And it resulted in overly inclusive groups with overly permissioned permission sets. That's why we came out with the functional grouping construct. And this construct is the cornerstone of our least privilege uh, framework. So we've open sourced this to our company where anyone can create a functional grouping construct and these, these functional groups can be linked to AWS permissions. A few examples of this are our FinOps dashboard readers. These are people that need to be able to read our QuickSight dashboards that have to do with our financial operations. That's a functional group. Another example is our LMS developers. Developers that need access to our accounts where our LMS is deployed, Blackboard Learn. So you can see this construct has a name, a description, and a group of managers. These managers can control membership of this functional group. But let's see what actual resources this code deploys. It will actually deploy three different groups in our Okta instance. It'll create the everyday group. 
This is the core group that our everyday permissions of these engineers are attached to. It'll then create a management group. And this is a special group that can add or remove users from the everyday group, but also has another responsibility. It can escalate people from the everyday group to an escalation group. And we'll go over the escalation group shortly. But how do we get these Okta groups and turn them into AWS permissions? With the tight integration between Okta and AWS SSO, these groups get synced immediately with SCIM. And once they're available in AWS SSO, we can then assign them to permission sets in a given account. We have a handful of permission sets that are also in our GitOps repo. These are well-defined patterns that we've outlined for, for different groups to access accounts in different ways. An example of two of these permission sets are read-only and power user. Let's see how these are applied to a new account. When a new account is created, we can also, in our infrastructure's repo, create uh, infrastructure's code repo, create account mappings, which attach these AWS SSO groups to permission sets in the new account. So in this case, our everyday group gets read-only permissions. Th these are permissions to log into the console, look at their workload, but not view any sensitive data and not be able to modify any resources. But then we attach the, escalated, or the escalation group to a more pri privileged role, the power user role. Just in case there's a scenario where our, our automation and our least privileged framework does not cover. So how does privilege escalation work in our system? We've created an internal web app called the Privilege Escalation Service. And what this Privilege Escalation Service is, is it gives development teams an opportunity to request an escalation. And what goes along with that request is a reason why they should escalate. And then a time frame for how long they need to escalate for, because all of this is going to be temporary. And then lastly, what group are they trying to escalate to? So once they submit that request, the managers of the group that they're trying to escalate to will be notified. They can then log into the privilege escalation service, and much like our PR process in the GitOps repo, they can review the reason and make sure that it aligns with our standards. Does this escalation use case actually have automation that can be used instead? If that's the case, maybe they tell the engineer that they should use the automation instead and deny the privilege escalation. Or maybe they agree with the reason why, why the escalation is requested. In that case, they'll approve the escalation. And that's when that user gets added to the privileged escalated group in Okta. Once they're in that group, they can log into the account with AWS SSO and perform the action that they set out to perform. But after the time frame is up, they are de-escalated from that group and are no longer able to access those privileged permissions. And this is all powered by AWS serverless technology, AWS Lambda, AWS Step Functions, and AWS Event Bridge. In fact, the entire escalation service is built on serverless technology. So this has been really successful for us. But what are some takeaways? We've seen that GitOps has been better for us than the ticketing flow. Now, when an engineer requests to make a change to our account governance framework, we know that we have all the information needed to make that change. There's not a back and forth anymore. And people are no longer putting in tickets and waiting for another person to complete the task. They're empowered to do it themselves. 
And with the PR process, there's now constructive conversations happening that may have not been happening in the ticketing system. There's a different dynamic that happens in the PR process that developers are very familiar with than with the ticketing process. And now more people understand our system. There's more internal visibility. You can look at our repo and understand what groups have access to what. So the internal visibility has really helped. Our developers are very smart and they can help contribute to our account governance framework. Scaling via automation. One of our goals was to make sure that we have faster delivery of infrastructure and governance tasks. Before, it could take up to a week and a half to create an account because it depended on our operations team's backlog, how many accounts were being requested, all of the manual tasks that were previously involved in creating an account. With this solution, account creation is down to minutes. 25 minutes after you merge the PR, the account will be created, all of the security guard rules will be applied, and access permissions will be applied. And an engineer can log into that account 25 minutes after the merge. Access changes are down to minutes. Previously, we had no ability to temporarily escalate users. And a lot of times, it was hard for engineers to formulate what access they needed in tickets because there wasn't a transparency of what access was given to different groups. Now everyone can understand by just looking in the repo. And in fact, in the PR process, we can actually point to code snippets that other teams are doing to, to apply certain permissions and help guide teams that are new to the repo. So there's more of a collective understanding of the governance solution and it reduces the burden that our operation team used to have and they're freed up to do other things. This solution has improved our security and access controls. We've been able to leverage it and use it as a catalyst to standardize Standardize on account patterns, like who gets what permissions in production. We've standardized on read only. With the help of Control Tower, we've been able to apply preventative guardrails and log everything to a centralized logging account. This has given us a single pane of glass to view our compliance of our accounts and the logs of our accounts. And lastly, it's made our system more auditable. Having that single pane of glass is great, but we also now have a repo that anyone can look in and see the state of our system. We also have a privilege escalation service where everyone can see who escalated and why, so that as a company, we can align on norms, what makes sense. But we're not done yet. AWS keeps coming out with services that can be implemented at the organizational level that we want to keep consuming. One of those is AWS Access Advisor. We want to see how our roles are being used in our accounts so we can get closer to lease permissions. What part of our permission sets are people using and what part are people not using? We want to leverage stack sets to go beyond the bootstrapping that Control Tower does for our accounts and potentially provision more resources at account creation. An example of this is maybe we want to apply budgets to new accounts. Or maybe we want to grant cross-account trust to our deployment pipelines account for a new account. That way there will be, there will be no additional steps after merging a PR to this repo. And lastly, we're always trying to um, get onboarding smoother. So we're looking into linking closer with our traditional HR process. Can we use the active directory attributes that are assigned to employees on hire and use those to dictate group membership? If an employee is on a, in a certain department on a certain team, they might automatically get added to certain octa groups. 
And if that status changes and they move to a different department, they could be removed from those octa groups and added to that department's octa groups. So this is something that we're looking into. If anyone in here is looking to implement a similar solution, we do have some lessons learned. Have a vision for your end state. We started this project with a technical document and we evangelized it in our company. We talked to our security teams. We talked to our architecture teams. And we talked to upper management to make this a group effort that everybody is happy with. And after we came up with that, we, came to, we went to our, S, our AWS teams to make sure that our plan was aligning with what AWS was going for, for multi-account best practices. So we, we pivoted a little bit and we made some changes to make sure that we were aligning with AWS's vision, because they're our partners. And lastly, and probably most importantly, whenever you're changing the way people access a system or changing their access, it's important to over-communicate. We made an effort to come out with blog posts every other sprint to tell people what is happening, why we are changing things, and how it's going to affect them. We also gave lunch and learn presentations to go over the Pulumi constructs that we're creating, and our infrastructure is code repo, in an effort to turn skeptics into allies. And that's, ended up, that's what ended up happening. And I'm happy to, sh happy to share that this solution has worked out very well for us. All right, and that's actually it. Do we have any uh, Q&A, any questions? Anyone have any questions? Do we, do we have a microphone? We are, I think we actually have a microphone here. So, so the question was, what, what happened to our existing accounts? Yeah, back in 2020 when you switched to Control Tower, so what happened to those? Yeah, so we were able to join all of our existing accounts to our Control, to control Tower, import it into Control Tower, um, and then we added our AWS code constructs to our repo and imported them into our code. So, um, so that allows us to change the tags via code uh, and, and really uh, use infrastructure as code for those accounts moving forward. And we also imported like, all, the, um, all the permission sets and account mappings for those. Okay. Did you have any conflicts with the existing config rules or you know, AWS config? Because that's a, that's a big challenge, right? My, that's my understanding. Right? Yeah, uh, when, when we first adopted um, control tower, um, we ended up just using the config rules that, that they put into our accounts, and, and uh, we, we're, we're using those as a standard now. And I think you were probably referring to, you have to, you have to turn off any config recorders that you have in existing accounts before you can import those into, into control tower. Yeah. yeah, that was definitely part of the process. Uh, when, when you um, request the escalation, are those um, escalation regions all predefined or um, anyone can type whatever they want? I think the question is, can you escalate to, um, is it, do you? So, so if I'm requesting uh, escalation, do I have to type um, whatever region I want or is the regions oh. are predefined, I have, I have to select from Got them? It. Got it. So, um, so our escalation service, as, a, as it currently works, is, is not region specific, it's account specific. So you, you, get, you, get a, you get privilege access in a certain account. Yeah. So I'm, asking, but, but, I'm asking for the purpose, right? If it's predefined that, okay, for this kind of accounts, these are the different regions you can select for escalation so that you can automate that instead of going to the manager, manager will review and it's going to take time. So if we can define in advance that these are the all region, someone can escalate uh, for uh, the privilege, then it will be easy for to automate. Got it. Yeah, let's chat offline. I I, I think I see what you're saying, but Thank I you. can answer your question more. This guy. Yeah. So my question is regarding the least privilege model. Yeah. Uh, during the presentation, you talked about the 
regarding the permissions to the developer yeah. and using access analyzer later on to yeah. evaluate the permission. So the point is like was the least privileged model adopted in the beginning of implementation of control tower or it was a like implemented later on? Yeah, so um, I talked about wanting to use Access Advisor. We don't currently use it right now. But, but what we do is, is we have a curated set of permission sets that we've defined as least permission, um, like the read-only role, no sensitive data, console only, view only, and that, and that kind of thing. It's a yeah. Repeat the question. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, was there did the gra did the developers just gravitate to this new solution, or was there hesitancy? Um, I think it depended on the group. Some groups were quick to adopt it. They were excited because they were empowered to be able to make these changes themselves. Other groups, it, it took a while to warm up a little bit. And it actually, you know, we had to work with those teams and, and, and walk them through creating the pull request and, uh, and walk them through why the solution would benefit them. Uh, so it was on a team by team basis. So you, you had to win over some teams. And some teams just, uh, just accepted the solution right away. Question over here. Oh, oh, sorry. Can you talk about the uh, FedRAMP uh, moderate? Is all these services available there? The FedRAMP? So FedRAMP Moderate is just a, 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 a security um, a, a Com compliance compliance a set of compliance. If you're talking referring to GovCloud, okay, GovCloud. Yeah. So um, so Control Tower is not yet in GovCloud, but um, all of the other resources that I talked about, we deploy separately to our our, our GovCloud tenant. So like so we have organizations for commercial and then AWS organizations and GovCloud, and then we have a separate Okta instance for GovCloud as well. So, so we have two stages of this pipeline, one for commercial and one for GovCloud, and all of the SSO stuff is available in GovCloud, and it works well. GovCloud. We have a question uh, here in the back. Yeah, real quick, uh, how did you guys scale the solution based on the load on your LMS? Um, to your point, uh, I have kids, they all complain about bandwidth. The schools complain about bandwidth. The colleges complain about bandwidth. So how does this solution, or did you guys even consider anything about scaling the solution? So this is really just kind of an infrastructure as code pipeline. So it just needs to be able to create accounts and attach permissions. So, um, so the scale that we were looking to kind of since we are a large scale, like almost 200 accounts, we just wanted to organize it in a repo and, and have a declarative way to define accounts. So I hope that answers the question. This guy. Back here. So. Yeah, the, the question was, were we using organizations in 2020 already? We were using it in, in, in some capacity because with our with our cost and, and billing stuff, um, so but Control Tower kind of added an extra layer on top of that uh, and extra conveniences, so it, it really helped out. So I, I definitely recommend Control Tower. It's made our made our lives a lot easier. How long did it take you to get from the idea until people were using it? That's a good question. Yeah, that is, that is so the uh, he was on mic, so I don't got to repeat it. Um, so. Uh, I believe it, it took about three months from the from talking to our AWS team to actually having the first team create a PR. So the way we started off was we just we started off with just the Octa groups in code uh, to to kind of define um, what the groups are, and then we expanded that to our um, AWS permission sets and account mappings, and then we expanded that to include AWS accounts as well. So it was kind of a, this gradual process where people got familiar with the repo, and then now it includes all the functionality necessary uh, to, for our full governance solution. We've got a couple up here. We've got some in the back. Okay. 
maybe just one or two more and then one or two more yep go ahead you mentioned a little something about um, AWS SSO and yeah. SSO at the account level did those two coexist for a while or is it like a hard switch that you had to do oh okay so so for some accounts we had uh, like feder I am federated access through Okta so before it was it predated AWS SSO and yeah, those coexist for a while until, until we went totally to AWS SSO. We, uh, so both would be there at the same time. We would tell developers, try out AWS SSO, make sure that you have you know, the same permissions, the, all the permissions you need, and then we were able to deprecate the, the old way and, and remove it from our code base. One more question. One more. Yeah. How do you um, manage the account deprovisioning process? Because I assume at some point, uh, Every account serves its purpose, and it's yes. time. To so, so that's that's interesting. We actually haven't found many use cases to deprovision accounts. We've just been adding accounts. Um, so, that's not actually in our the the infrastructure as code provider that I presented. We don't actually provide a destruction method. Um, in fact, like there's no API, or there might be an API there is now. now. Yes, it just there is was now. announced. But before, like last month, there was no way to actually programmatically uh, delete an account. So, uh, and, and one strategy you might want to take when when looking to deprovision an account is to create a, a suspended account OU, which is basically has a deny star star on the whole OU as as an SCP, and just throw them in there for a while. That way, they're completely locked out. Nothing can can uh, take place. And then, if when you decide you actually do want to to remove them, you can. So I've seen customers do that. And that's actually something Control Tower creates for you, the suspended OU. And yeah, so you, yeah, like you said, you can move it into that OU. So I, I think we're, Tim and I will be outside this door um, because I know we're going to have to let the other, other folks in here soon. Um, just want to plug uh, AWS Skill Builders. Um, so uh, if you are looking to up your, your AWS game, we have a lot of great uh, learning resources online. Um, after you've done that, you definitely want to consider looking into AWS certifications to sort of validate, you know, the, the skills that you've learned and show, you know, your employer and potential employers, like, the, the level of skill that you have. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for coming today. I hope that this session has really thought, uh, helped you think about um, how you might innovate as far as, you, you know, the account provisioning and governance process. I think the thing, uh, the, the solution that Tim and Anthology have built here is really interesting, and I can't wait to see what, all, what you all build uh, it, it, with this thought, so. Yeah, thank you, and Anthology is hiring, anthology.com. <laughs> all right, thanks. Oh, please, 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 please fill out the survey. I, I guarantee that, uh, People at AWS pour over this data. We are a data-driven company, and we absolutely uh, look at this data to figure out what sessions you are most interested in at a future summit. So please uh, take a moment to fill out the survey. Thank you all. Have a great summit. We'll Thank you.